welcome to today's Barnes Takeout. My name is Amy Gillette. I'm a collections researcher at the foundation. Now today, let's head on into room 23, looking into the corner, and we're going to focus on this painting. Let's go in a little bit closer. It's entitled The Rose Tower, painted in the year 1913 by the Italian artist Giorgio de Chirico. Now, let's zoom on in. Okay, so what have we got here? Um, like I said, painted in 1913 by de Chirico, and the Rose Tower is indeed dominated by this big Rose Tower at center. Um, some scholars have looked into this and proposed that it might actually be this um, funerary tower of uh, Cecilia Metella, an ancient mon Roman monument in the city of Rome that is ancient up to about here and has these medieval accretions on top that you might be able to see looks a bit like those battlements up there, but clearly it's, if it is that, it is a little bit abstracted. And as much as it looms, it's kind of cut off at base by this low wall over here. Beyond, we can see the red tiled roofs of some, I suppose, generic Mediterranean town, um, Italy perhaps, or Greece, where de Chirico had been born and grown up. Mountains beyond, lit by the sort of late afternoon greenish, bluish sky. Then we have, again, just Mediterranean style buildings. This one with the shutters and doors shut being sort of hit by um, the sunlight. This one causing the raking shadows across with the arcade and windows open. We have also here a statue of a horse on a plinth black horse with a foreleg up, and down here what looks perhaps like some other um, maybe empty plinth. And so what on earth is going on with this painting, we might be wondering, and I think the answer is, as a matter of fact, quite a lot. And so we have this Roman monument that for de Chirico seems to symbolize this, um, the, the, the word that he used was the sort of nostalgia for the infinite, but I think that the real key to the picture is in the horse to begin understanding it. So let's go on over. And even though the, um, the tower is kind of generic or made generic, the horse is specifically this monument in the Italian city Turin to Carlo Alberto up here, although in De Chirico's picture, the horse itself, let's go back, is, um, is kind of obscured by this um, open arcade of the building over here. And and that square in Turin is where de Chirico's hero, the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, was living in the year 1888 in an apartment overlooking that statue. And in that year, which happened to be the same that de Chirico was born, Nietzsche saw a horse getting publicly um, flogged, unfortunately, and ran out to embrace the horse and try to save it. And this was the um, the precipitate of a breakdown that Nietzsche had suffered where his really brilliant mind kind of unraveled. And so it was um, really a, lim a liminal moment for the philosopher and for de Chirico. Now, some years later in, um, in 1910, de Chirico was standing in a square in Italy um, in an autumn afternoon, October, with the light raking like this. He'd been reading Friedrich Nietzsche and thought that this afternoon light kind of cast over the limpid geometries of um, Italian buildings exposed the metaphysics, the second order of things in a very kind of Nietzschean sense. And de Chirico started to identify himself with Nietzsche, especially because um, of the like co coincidence of his birth year with what had happened with Nietzsche in Turin and thought that his paintings like this one um, from what he termed his metaphysical period could embody um, the thought of Nietzsche. And that to my mind embodies kind of three components. And the first of those, if you're familiar with Nietzsche, you might have heard the phrase God is dead, which was a point that was really much more cultural than theological as I understand it, where in the 19th century kind of 
the the church was no longer governing people's lives, giving external meaning in a in a way that it had in centuries past. But that opened up the ability for people to create their own meaning. Um, something that Nietzsche and then de Kirchhoff picked up as a sort of will to power, often by recourse to the myths of the past. And so in this way, um, Nietzsche had kind of come to identify himself with the son of Carlo Alberto. And so we can kind of see this horse as almost an avatar of Nietzsche in the same way in de Chirico's own self-mythologizing. He comes to be a kind of Nietzsche. Um, and, and both of them turned to the classical world for inspiration. And that, again, is a kind of another, another point, the third part of Nietzschean metaphysics that I think is really important for de Chirico is the idea of eternal return or recurrence where everything that's happened, th that is happening has happened before and will happen again. And, um, and that is really what makes meanings progressive and accumulate through time. And so I think that by recycling these um, modern classical motifs, de Chirico is putting new meaning onto them into these structures of thinking that he's creating for the world. And it's something that Albert Barnes was very mindful of. And so the architecture itself is kind of classicizing, you might notice, but if you look at it, you'll be able to see that the perspective isn't perfect. And um, and that's something that is actually sort of on purpose, where de Chirico was not looking to like high Renaissance perfection, um, trying to recreate the world precisely as you see it scientifically, but looking to older masters um, such as Giotto. And this is an example I love um, from the Church of Santa Croce in Florence, where it's the ascension of um, St. John the Evangelist coming out of his tomb down here to the surprise of people around and zooming straight through this like opened up building into the arms of Christ in heaven. And de Chirico actually wrote um, in the paintings of John Giotto, the architectonic sense reaches high metaphysical spaces. All of the openings, the doors, the arcade, the windows that accompany his figures let us present the cosmic mystery. And um, this is something that Albert Barnes himself had actually recognized. Let me go back. Barnes wrote, De Chirico's design is attained by modifications of old and new traditions. His massive architectural elements and composition are reminiscent of old Italian masters. He's made a new use, though, of linear patterns and the geometric forms of cubism. De Chirico's best work is a plastic equivalent of mystical poetry. It's this ability to render the essence of the metaphysical, which was responsible for the development of the movement termed surrealism. Um, and for the record, both Dr. Barnes as well as um, Georgia De Chirico hated the movement surrealism. But to look back, at where our painting is, I think this is really kind of the best of the Barnes Foundation in in a certain way, where um, the artists that Dr. Barnes did champion the most really did draw from world traditions in order to create something new. And if we take this idea that meaning is progressive, it's new for us too each time um, we enter into the foundation. So that's it for today's Takeout, and thank you so much for joining. I'm Tom Collins, Neubauer Family Executive Director of the Barnes Foundation. I hope you enjoyed Barnes Takeout. Subscribe and make sure your post notifications are on to get daily servings of art. Thanks for watching and for your support of the Barnes Foundation.